Today we're going to take a look at another one of our fears uh, as we go through, especially this time, but just any time in our life. We're, we're going to take a look at a fear of finances and really God's answer to that today. So today we're going to take a look at our finances and God's provision, the way he comes through for us in this. Because one of the most amazing, incredible, all-encompassing promises in the Bible is in Philippians 4.18 where God says this, God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Jesus Christ. Now, if you think about it, this verse is really packed, right? It has all sorts of stuff in it. For first of all, it says God will. It doesn't say he might do it or he could do it or maybe he'll get around to doing it. He says, I will, he will. It's a fact. He's staking his character. He's staking his reputation on it. He says, I will meet all of your needs. And then it goes on, God says, I will meet all. Right? It doesn't say that it'll meet some of the needs that you have. It says, I'm going to meet all the needs that you have. Now, does that include car payments? Yeah. Uh, how about braces? Absolutely. Home? Yes. He says, all your needs. Now, it doesn't say, I'll meet all your greeds. You know, one of the interesting things during this COVID-19 shut-in time, and even as we get going again, is, is that a lot of people have been furloughed. A lot of people have been let go in their jobs. There's a lot of financial pressure. There's a lot of financial concern in our world today. You got the stock market going up. You got the stock market going down. It's just created a lot of stress. But what has done very well during this time is alcohol and marijuana sales. They actually have gone through the roof. We'll call those greeds and not needs, right? Because there's a difference between needs and wants, aren't there? As a parent, do you give everything that your kids ask for? Do you give it, just give it to them? Well, I hope you don't. And why do I say that? Well, you don't do that because you love them, because you don't want to turn them into a spoiled brat, because you want them to appreciate the things that you've given them and that God's given them. And here's the thing, your Heavenly Father loves you too, and so he's not going to give you everything that you want in life or you'd be spoiled to death, right? But it does say, I will meet all your needs according to his wealth, his riches. So it's something that's not based on my assets, which is just wonderful in every single way. It's based on what God has. And he doesn't run out of resources, he is the God that can speak things into being. He doesn't have to have a bunch of resources. He can just say, here it is, a million dollars, and there it is. And then he goes on to say this. He says, this is all for you in Christ Jesus. And so this is a promise only for believers. And I need you to hear that. This is a hard thing for a lot of folk. This is a promise that is not for everybody. God has not promised to meet everybody's needs. God has not promised to meet the needs of people who reject his son. This is a promise that's only for believers, for those who are in Jesus Christ. But he says, if you're one of my kids, if you're one of my children, if you're in my family, I promise, I promise to meet every one of your needs. So all of a sudden you're listening to this and you say, well, how come you have financial needs? Or how come I know people who are believers that are in financial need? Did God fail them? Did, did he lie? Did he exaggerate in some possible way? And the answer is no, no, and no. You see, with Scripture, with every promise, there is a premise, isn't there? There are conditions, there are requirements that God asks of us. In other words, there are things that God says, I'll do my part. I'll send my son to die on the cross for you to forgive all of your sins, and you do your part, which is usually a lot less. It's I want you to believe that I did those things. I want you to believe in me as your Lord and Savior. I want you to trust me with your life. God has his part, and he asks that we do our part. And so God has laid out some financial principles in his word, and there are a ton of financial principles actually in scripture, more than I can go into this morning. There's principles on savings, there's principles on spending, there's principles on giving, there's principles on investing, there's principles for how to use your resources. In fact, Dave Ramsey is an incredible source or resource for this. And not surprisingly, as you listen to his stuff, Almost every single one of his principles are found in Scripture. And so there are some conditions that we can look at this morning, right? Specifically for, these are preconditions. These are the things that are our part so that when God says, if you're doing your part, I'm going to open up the storehouses of heaven for you. This is where God says, if you meet these conditions, then I'll guarantee that I will meet all of your financial needs. And that's pretty big, 
right? That's a huge promise, especially as we consider all the stress that we've been experiencing financially over the past several months. And you can't help it. I mean, when the stock market going up and down, if you're in retirement age, you're, you're worried about that big time. If you've been furloughed or let go, you're worried about where is your next paycheck coming from? Where are you going to get the funds to put uh, food on the table? And so this is a guarantee that if you do these things, you'll never have to worry about finances again because God will come through in ways that will just blow you away. And that's exactly what God says. God has promised to meet all of my financial needs. So what are these preconditions? Well, let's start with the first one. If I ask for his help, that's a precondition. In James 4, 2, it says, you do not have because you do not ask God. That's pretty clear, isn't it? God's, in other words, just kind of waiting for us to ask. The scripture says that God never shuts his storehouses until we, you know, shut our mouths. And he wants to help. That's the bottom line. He's a loving father. He desires to help us. He desires to support us. But the problem is, is that you don't even ask. For example, last time that you needed a car, did you ask God for it or did you just go out and buy it? My guess, if we're being honest, is that you probably didn't ask at all. You probably didn't pray about it at all. You just went out and bought it. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Did you catch that? Ask, seek, knock. What does that spell? <laughs> ask, actually, which is kind of cool. God's just saying there's three different ways. I want you to keep doing this. Ask, seek, knock, keep on asking. Get the message. Over 20 times in the New Testament, God says, ask me. I'm here for you. I want you to ask. And one of the reasons why you never see the miracles that you want to see in your life is simply this. We just forget to ask for it. Would you like to see God work in your life more? And God just says, start asking. So here's the spiritual law. Before you pay for it, pray for it. In other words, stop and ask God. Give God a chance to come through. Give God a chance to give it to you before you go out and just charge it. Because you probably will. Truth of the matter is, is you probably depend, trust more in your charge card than you do in Jesus Christ. You know, you're going to live within your income even if you have to charge it, right? That's the theme of our government, it seems, today. God says, ask. I want you to ask me for things in your life. Remember in the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. God put it in there so it would be a reminder to ask him for the blessings, for the things that we need in life on a regular basis to come before him. So before you pay for it, stop and pray for it. So why does God want me to ask? Because he's a loving dad, right? And, and loving fathers love to bestow gifts on their kids. I love my kids. I got three girls. I love them so much, and I love to give them things when I can. In John 16, verse 24, Jesus is talking, and he says this. You've not asked for anything in my name. Guys, ask, and you will receive, so that your joy will be to the fullest possible joy. If you break that down, it's kind of cool, right? Why does God want me to ask? so that he can give. And why does he want to give? So that I can receive. And why does he want me to receive? <laughs> so that I will be full of joy. Why does he want me to be full of joy? Because it's a great advertisement for his son, Jesus Christ. Joyful Christians are a positive testimony in this world. Sourpost Christians, not so much, right? People who are sucking on pickles, they're all bad testimonies. But if you pray, and here's the spiritual truth, if you pray as much about your finances as you worry about them, you'll have a whole lot less to worry about. And so God just says to you this morning, ask. I, I'm waiting for you to ask me. There's another precondition that God gives us when it comes to our finances and all of our concerns about finances, and it's this. If you'll learn to be content. <sighs> Why does God want us to be content? <laughs> because God's far more interested in our character than he is in our comfort. He wants you to grow up, to be mature, to be like his son Jesus. And to be honest, that's the hope for every parent, right? That we mature, that we grow up, that we eventually move out of the house. And so he's not so interested just in making your life easy. He watches your attitude. He watches your growth. 
if, if I bought into this system of our world that I think that having more will make me more happy, or if I just intend to use all of my wealth, right, on, just selfishly on myself, or, or if I think about things more than I think about God, you start asking, why in the world should he, I don't know, aid my addiction, you know, continue to fund my addiction? Thing is, he's watching our attitudes. In 1 Timothy 6, it says, There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we certainly can take nothing out of it. And that makes sense. If you've ever seen a baby born, you just know, you know, they don't come into the world with a whole lot. Right? They're not bringing along with them cigars and cars and all sorts of stuff like that when they're coming in. They, to be honest, don't have anything in the world at all, just a little umbilical cord that gets cut pretty quick along the way. And then you start thinking at a funeral, right? You don't really take much out with you as you go either. The pharaohs of old actually tried this. They filled their tomb with gold and all sorts of stuff that they would carry on to the next life. But the only problem was is that they didn't take a single penny of it. Grave robbers would come years or centuries later and take it all back. So the thing is, if you make the things on earth that were just to basically used for the next 80 years or so, if you make those the main things, you miss what life's all about. So God just encourages, don't make it, make it those things the most important things in your life. Because the most important things in your life, to be honest, they're not things. So God says, learn to be content. That begs the question, doesn't it? How do we learn to be content? Because this is the second requirement of God working in your life, especially in this area of finance, right? And so you learn contentment by stopping the things that cause discontent. It just makes sense. And what's the number one thing that causes discontent in our world today? Comparing yourself. Comparing yourself causes discontent every single time. And so God says it's stupid to compare yourself. Stop doing it. And when we compare ourselves, we compare our weaknesses, right, with other people's strength. Or we compare what we don't have to somebody who does have it. So you compare houses and clothes and cars and all sorts of things. I bought a computer about a year ago, and I was kind of looking through a magazine the other day, and I realized I want the new one, right? I mean, it had some new thing that it had on it, and I just wanted that one instead, all the way through our lives, we're encouraged by media, by commercials to compare, to want more. For example, have you ever bought a new car and you're so happy with your new car? You love it so much. You love the smell. You love the car. Everything about it. And all of a sudden, the next year, the new model comes out, but it's got this wing ding on it. And you realize you just got to have one of those wing dings. I mean, those are the most important things in life. Life isn't worth living without a wing ding on your car. And all the advertisements, all of the marketing that you see, they're telling you just that very thing, that you aren't worth a zip unless you got a wing ding. So we're constantly comparing. And comparing causes discontent. And because of discontent, God says, you can't handle what I want to get to you. Because you're putting too much priority on things in your life. You've lost sight of what's truly important. So one of the questions that you ask yourself with this section is, can God really trust me with the wealth that he desires to give? So have you learned to be content? God says he wants you to learn contentment in this life. And I don't know why it is, but God seems to have chosen money to be kind of the acid tests of our faith. Think about it. We spend our entire lives trying to earn it, trying to make it, trying to save it, trying to spend it, trying to use it. We, we think about it literally, it seems like, all the time. And I think that's why God chooses to use finances as the acid test of how much you trust him in your life. He wants us to ask when we have a need, and he wants us to learn to be content, to really rejoice over the gifts that he's given us in this life. And that our happiness isn't dependent on how much or how little that we've got, but it's dependent upon him. And if you don't learn contentment, to be honest, you're never going to learn to be happy. Why? Because you'll always still want more and more and more. Another precondition that God gives. If you practice giving in faith, in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously 
will also reap generously. See, God is able to make all grace abound to you. And so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will be abound, abundant in every good work. Now, I want you to notice the promises in this text. This is the principle of sowing and reaping. This is the principle that is given all the way through Scripture. It is the law of the universe, and it applies to every area of your life. For example, if I sow criticism... Chances are I'm going to reap criticism. If I sow kindness, I'm going to reap kindness. If I sow generosity, God says I'm going to get generosity in return. If I sow energy, I'm going to reap energy. It's kind of a, an amazing thing, but if you go to the gym, right, and you work out and you work out hard and you wear yourself out, you kind of think, well, I'm tired. I don't know if it worked. But the next day, you'll have even more energy because by expending energy, you produce more and more and more. It's like giving blood, right? You go and you give blood and you think, oh, man, I'm just going to have to figure out how to live with less blood. But no, the blood reproduces itself within you. It multiplies. Whenever you need more of anything in life, God says, you give it away. That's true with money too. It's true with everything in your life. And I know as we think about it, it seems illogical that, that when I have a need, I need to give it away because it doesn't make sense. It is logical, at least in terms of the world. But that's why it requires faith. God says this. He says, my ways are not your ways. And why did God set it up that way? I don't know. Because God is a giver, I guess. He is the most generous giver that the world has ever known. He's the most generous giver in all of the universe. And God wants you to learn to be like him. His number one characteristic is that he is a giver. Remember in scripture it says, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave us Jesus. Again, God always seems to do the hard part. And he asks us just to believe, just to trust, just to follow. And God wants you to learn to be generous too. And if you don't learn to be generous, if you don't learn to give, if you're stingy and miserly, always worrying about what, you're gonna, what you've got rather than what you can give away, you're never going to be like Jesus and when God set up heaven and earth and the universe, he said, I'm going to reward my children if they're like me, if they trust me. So every time you're generous and you trust God and you give, God says, give and it will be given to you. And here's the truth. You cannot outgive God. Last one. Last precondition. If I trust him with all of my life, in Matthew 6, it says, Your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well what you need. And he will give it to you if you give him first place in your life and live as he wants you to live. When I was a little kid, I, anytime I needed money, I, I just remember going to my dad and said, Dad, I need money for this or for that. And not once in all my entire life to great, growing up did I ever wonder where dad was going to get the money to give to me. I mean, not once. I just figured he had it, right? It was his job. He's the dad. I'm the kid. Kids spend, fathers make. It's kind of a deal we have. But many of you, I think today, act like you're spiritual orphans. you got this amazing Heavenly Father that loves you so much in heaven and says your Heavenly Father already knows what you need. He's just waiting for you to come to him and ask do you know you actually show God honor when you come and ask him? Because not only do you treat him then as he's real, but you treat him as one that can provide and that one that wants to because he cares for you, because he loves you. In Scripture it says, does God take care of the birds? Solomon actually talks about this, and Jesus does too. They don't worry, and nothing in all creation worries except human beings, to be honest. Did those birds worry in that parable of Jesus? No. The only thing that in all of creation worries is human beings. Everything else trusts implicitly that the Heavenly Father, the creator of the world, will care for their needs. In Psalm 111, verse 5, it says, He gives food to those who trust in Him. He never forgets His promises. The book of Romans tells us that, that God sent us His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross to pay for our salvation. And if you think about it, if God loves you enough to send his own son, to have him die, go through all that he did, don't you think he loves you enough to care about your bills? 
Don't you realize that any other problem that we face in this life is, is so minor by comparison? Because he's already solved the biggest problem that we'll ever face in our life. The bottom line really is just this. Am I going to believe God to do what he said he would do? That he will provide for me, that he will care for me? Am I going to believe him enough to do what he's called me to do when he asked me to follow him? See, the theme verse for this whole series is really Psalm 34, verse 4, where it says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all of my fears. See, the answer to all of your fears as a person, it's Jesus. You need to hope in the Lord. And when I say hope, trust in with all of your heart. And so when you're afraid in any area of your life, whether it be finances or health or no matter what it would be, when you're afraid in any area of your life, it's because you've forgotten what God is like. You've forgotten somehow who he is and what it is that he has promised you. And I pray for you this morning is that you never forget. That you never forget how much God absolutely loves you. And all God's people said, amen. And so let me pray. God, we love you so much and we thank you for today. And as we do deal with some of the financial struggles that we have over the last few months, worrying about where our next paycheck's coming from, worrying about how to get reemployed or if we've just been furloughed getting back to work. Father, not only do we pray keep us safe, but continue to provide a, an easy way for us to get back into the workforce and get going again. If it's, if it's those of us that are struggling with our retirement and looking toward that and the market's gone up and down in and, and all sorts of different ways, we would just pray in the midst of all the changes, Lord, that you would still have us, that you've still got us, that you'll still provide, that you're still watching, that you still know. Let us continue to trust in your promises. Every time we get afraid, every time we get nervous, let us trust that you've got us in the midst of the storm. And Father, we're talking about finances today, but the reality is that this is true in every area of your, our lives. Every one of those things that we go through through in the next, I don't know, seven, eight weeks, right, is gonna be talking about one of our fears and the solution that you provided in your son, Jesus Christ. The solution that you provided in your scriptures through your promises. Let us grab hold of those with all of our heart and help us do the hardest thing in this world. Help us trust you with more and more and more and more in our lives so that we can experience more and more and more of your peace, of your goodness, and of your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Guys, go with this blessing. May our Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious always unto you. And may he look upon you now with his favor and grant you forever his peace. Amen.